Can a regular meditation practice fix or cure narcissism? That's the topic I'm going to be exploring in this video. This is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. So, this very topic of meditation and narcissism, it's a tricky one because on the one hand, on paper, it, in quotation marks, should help, but very often it doesn't. And I'm going to be exploring why I think it doesn't really do much for narcissism and also what would have to be there for it to really make a difference. So first of all, let's define terms here. So when I talk about narcissism, I'm talking about a personality style where someone can be more or less narcissistic. So someone who's very narcissistic has a strong drive or perceived need to be special, to be special and to be unique. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if I'm really, really special and very, very unique per definition, you're kind of not. And that drive or orientation, this compulsion or obsession to be special, very easily then leads to a sense of entitlement, which seems to be a big hallmark of narcissism. I'm special, so I'm entitled. If I'm entitled, I have special rights. I don't have to follow the rules. I don't have to stay in line, so to speak, like everyone else. And if I'm entitled, then I can easily rage and get very angry if, if, if I don't get what I want because I'm entitled to it and I'm special. And it becomes easy to exploit, to exploit other people because they don't necessarily have the same the same rights, you know, due, due to my entitlement. And I'm, I'm less inclined to be compassionate or to really see someone else's individuality a, a, as a person, because why, why should I, you know? So as a result of this, people with strong narcissistic personality styles can be quite unpleasant to have to deal with, especially long term as you get to know them better. N now, a lot of this compulsion or need to be special seems to be driven by an emotion phobia of sorts, specifically um, a, a kind of emotion phobia towards vulnerable emotions. It's essentially shame based. So in an effort to not feel these vulnerable emotions, there's this facade of grandiosity and, and, and being on top of the world uh, in the kind of grandiose narcissist. And of course, then, then you have the more vulnerable narcissist who, who's special due to how much they're suffering. And it's more that sullen victimhood, uh, essentially, where they can come across as, as depressed and, 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 and fragile. But they've suffered more than anyone else. And the world hasn't you know, seen their talents, uh, so to speak. Now, in meditation, of course, the, the bull's eye in meditation is essentially to break that spell of identification, that spell of identification that makes it seem as if the voice of the mind, so to speak, is who and what we are. So the, the, the bull's eye of meditation is to be able to have the realization that there's no such thing thing as a self. There's no stable, autonomous entity in there that's calling the shots, making decisions. There's no thing like self to be special, right? It's just life unfolding. So in theory, meditation, especially self-inquiry, 
should be a cure. And, and, and when I say cure, I don't mean that literally because it's not a disease. But, but it, it should be on paper a cure uh, regarding narcissism because, because it, if there's truly a realization that there's no such thing as a self inside of us, there, there, there's no self to be special to, to, to get narcissistic supply and validation and stuff like that. If that's clearly seen, then the thinking and feeling and behaving uh, on behalf of that, you know, alleged special self should reduce or drop off. And I, so one thing that can happen, of course, is that the more the self is seen as a process, as a selfing process, but not who or what we are, of course, then self-referential thoughts and feelings may reduce in intensity and in duration, look less real, and that might help us make be less narcissistic. Of course, in theory, if as with someone like Gary Weber, for example, if self-referential thinking were to more or less completely stop, then in theory at least, there, there shouldn't be any basis for narcissism, right? But here's the really funny part. If you spend some time you know, in meditation groups, in non-duality non forums and communities, you'll find no shortage of people who seem to have strong narcissistic tendencies. You'll, you'll find people who have decades of meditation experience. You know, p p people who can talk the talk, people who may have had these sorts of realizations. And they can still they can still come across as extremely narcissistic. So what's going on here? How 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 could people meditate for decades and at least seemingly have these realizations into the nature of, of mind and thought and the illusory, you know, the the, the, the self being an illusion? And, and still come across as very narcissistic. Well, I, I, I think there's a couple of logical explanations for this. One is that, let's say that it's seen that the sense of self is generated by thinking so th there's no longer the identification with the narrative mind, so to speak, but instead there's an identification with consciousness or being itself, right? So th there's still a selfing process going on. There's still self-referential thinking. There's still uh, selfing in the sense of, you know, creating distinctions and boundaries and claiming ownership over things. So now, instead of the selfing process, identifying with the narrative mind, these self-referential thoughts and feelings, let's say that there's this, there's this realization of, of oneness, of the self being an illusion, what can very easily happen now is that the selfing process jumps in and claims credit for that insight. So, so, so now you have the identity of being a great meditator or an enlightened person or an, an awakened being who has special access to whatever they might believe, you know, the voice of God or the voice behind all creation speaking through them, you know, this is likely to make them more narcissistic, you know, because before this, there was the identification with the narrative mind. Now, suddenly there's, there's this 
I am consciousness, I am being, you know, I, I, I am God, I am that which everything arises out of. So if, if the selfing process kicks in and claims credit for this, you, you might have someone with a very spiritual ego whose narcissism has in fact increased. So that's one explanation. Another explanation is, you know, once again, narcissism seems to be a kind of personality style. And it doesn't seem as if meditation, even long term meditation, necessarily does that much with people's basic personality tendencies. So if, if you look at people with these cluster B personality tendencies, those seem to be pretty hardwired. It, it seems as if people can meditate for a long time, seemingly have insights without that necessarily touching or altering too much those patterns of personality. So if someone has a personality style that's kind of narcissistic, and let's say they have a brain that's just not wired up to be very compassionate, for example, you know, that, that circuitry just isn't there. You, you could have someone then who, 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 who's had some tremendous insights, but who still kind of comes off as a jerk. It's not necessarily a, a, a nice person to, to be around. And here, here's, here's a final thing. If the theory is right, that narcissism to a large extent is a kind of emotion phobia of sorts, you know, a, a fear of vulnerable emotions. Well, to, to the extent that a meditation practice could help someone see that mechanism and have choice regarding it and to you know come in touch with those vulnerable emotions be able to fully feel them be with them and no longer identify with them and thereby lose their fear of those vulnerable you know emotions then in theory at least the narcissistic tendencies should decrease but if you just do self-inquiry or, or, or Vipassana or, or, or something like that, you, you, you may still have this emotion phobia, you know, tendency. Um, yeah. So, so, so I think that's kind of what probably would have to happen for narcissistic tendencies to dramatically reduce. Here's also something interesting to look at. And, and that is that you, you can do a lot of meditation and it, it can help you wake up, but it won't necessarily help you grow up psychologically. So if you take a look at, for example, a book like Zen at War, you, you, you can see examples of, you know, Zen masters who've had these realizations but they're still making sense of these realizations from a very ethnocentric, uh, conventional stage of psychological development. You know, they're still racist and sexist and, and it, it's still very ethnocentric. So someone could have meditative realizations, but still psychologically operate from an early or, or, or kind of conventional stage of development, whether that be whether you use the work of Claire Graves or Spiral Dynamics or Robert Keegan's model or, or ego development. Um, meditation won't necessarily make you a more mature or psychologically sophisticated person, right? So th th that's also essential. And if here's something kind of ironic too 
if if you look at the societies in the world that tend to be the most peaceful and less violent and less corrupt it is those societies who kind of orient towards the rights of the individual there, there there's a, a strong emphasis on the individual and if you look at the people who often create the most trouble for other people and who also you know are kind of immature and shallow uh if you talk about the cluster b personality tendencies you know borderline patterning and narcissistic and the social and, and, and psychopathic histrionic uh, you will see that one common denominator with these folks is that they have never really developed a sense of a stable psychological self over time that's that that's one common denominator so meditation then which is largely about helping someone see that that thing like self is an illusion is not necessarily going to help someone develop that stable sense of self so if you look at this from a developmental perspective it, it seems to be the human trajectory to slowly but surely you know as we mature to develop and construct a sense of an autonomous separate independent permanent core self that's kind of a hallmark of an adult in in the western world and and then if people develop beyond that or further than that the next step is to begin to see the illusory nature of this very self that's been constructed but of course a lot of adults and a lot of people haven't really constructed that sense of self to begin with uh, properly and, and, and that seems to be how we humans naturally you know tend to evolve so for some people you know self-inquiry and a heavy meditation practice might even be you know anti-developmental in the sense that it's 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 trying to deconstruct something that someone perhaps might just be in the process of beg of beginning to construct for themselves and, and and even if this stable sense of self is an illusion it does seem to be a kind of necessary one to learn to see to learn to develop proper boundaries and to be able to see other people as individuals who have their own psychological life separate from the group or separate from our own perceived needs and wants we seem to have to be able to construct that before we can see the truly interconnected nature of things and have the realization that the very sense of self that we take ourselves to be is in fact an illusion so meditation here can truly be a double-edged sword so I, I hope this was useful uh, and, and thought-provoking. If some of these ideas resonate with you and, and you would like to have a guide on your meditation journey, or if you would like to, to see if you and I could be a good fit in terms of helping you create some, some changes or shifts in your life, you can reach me at provocativehypnosis.com. I also have a couple of seminars coming up, a couple of online seminars regarding anxiety. I'm doing a live seminar in October in Australia. This is 2024, obviously. So if you're interested, check the seminar page at provocativehypnosis.com. If you have any questions or comments or objections, by all means, you know, write them down where you find the, the video and I'll get back to you. And as always, thanks for listening.